jiggy with it. Getting jiggy with it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Aaron, and uh, I'm one of the strategists in uh, Vancouver. Um, so today I want to talk to you guys about strategically looking at social media from a different perspective. And I purposely try not to get into too many examples uh, because I think we've seen some great case studies uh, today. Um, these two presentations before me, it's like you guys perfectly set me up for what I'm going to talk about. So Matt, with your ROI numbers, that's fantastic. And Sophie, with your um, MPS score, amazing to see that you guys are doing that. Where is Sophie? Over here? Yeah, fantastic. <coughs> so. When I was back in university, um, I once saw a public speaker come and, you know, when I was planning my career path, I was really excited to talk to this guy. And then he put up a slide that said, complacency will be your downfall. And I really thought about that. And I was in the programming development world. And then that scared the heck out of me because I realized I can't keep up with the pace of technology and coding. I wasn't the smartest coder. So I thought I'd give marketing a try because that's a nice, safe bet. Um, then social media happened and I'm right back to where that was. So. This has really stuck with me because I don't like the status quo. I want to see things evolve and change because the world's changing so quickly. And I feel that DMOs have a lot of changing to do because we're still doing the same old stuff. So um, this is ideally what I'd like to see is that destinations need to build a vision for the destination and not just market it, but start to manage their destination like a business. And most of us will probably say, yeah, yeah, we do that, but we don't. And we are here the same kind of challenges across the board with many DMOs that I work with. And some of those key things are we have tight budgets. We don't have the time to jump on every social media channel. We just don't have time in general. Um, we need to be visible to our stakeholders. So all these challenges are across the board and we need to change what we're doing and reporting back to our industry. So looking at this, the definition of advertising. Take a quick read through this, and I'm gonna juxtapose it with another definition. And be honest, and take a look at your DMO, and which side are you really on as an organization? So this is advertising. This is marketing. Let's take a look at that. Would anybody here say that they're probably more on the advertising side? Nobody wants to safely say that? There's a couple hands went up. So in my experience, I've seen a lot of destinations that pro claim to be on the marketing side. Most of their tactics and activities are really about advertising. And we're really kind of stuck in this advertising mode. As a result, we tend to really focus on measuring noise. The noise that we produce from earned media, from print, from even our digital channels. Look how many people we reached. You know, look at the number of followers, the number of likes, and it's all kind of noise that we're measuring to report back big numbers. So it's not really our fault though, because we've kind of gone through this shift with marketing over time with our industry. And at first we struggled to work with them to teach them what earned media value is from a TV spot or a magazine piece. And to the industry, they're just like, yeah, we don't really understand it, but we'll kind of go along with it. And so we'd report back a really big number saying, look how effective this magazine piece was or this TV spot we did. Then it kind of evolved into websites. And then we struggled to teach our industry why websites are important and why website visitation is so important. So they kind of reluctantly went along and they would build a website when they have time. But it wasn't a priority for many of our industry partners because most of them are small mom and pop shops. And I'd have to wager a guess, but I'm guessing almost everybody here, the majority of your businesses are small mom and pop, medium sized businesses, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah. So we struggled to teach them website visits, then social media comes along, and now we're struggling to teach them why they need a Facebook page. So the whole time we're trying to teach them to market and they just, that's not their job. Their job is really focusing on their business. So we've been struggling um, to teach them likes, and now we're probably struggling to teach them why engagement's more important than Facebook likes. Is that right? Yeah. So this is just always teaching the industry something. So what if we started to teach them something different, something that they could focus on and something that they can see the value in and shift the conversation away from them having to market? Because some of them are just aren't gonna do that, and that's their business decision. So just to put this in perspective, when I first joined the tourism industry, um, it was in like 2005, I started working at Travel Alberta. Um, 
And the first day on the job, I was a, a techie guy from a web content background, and I loved coding and CMS, and I was getting into the marketing side because it was going to be easier. And my boss pulls me into his office, and he sits down, and he says, Aaron, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. There's no real way we can measure the effectiveness of our marketing as an organization until we just stop for two years, measure the baseline, and then start again. I thought he was crazy. I, I didn't make sense to me, but as I started to see how the business works, I realized there's so many other factors that affect the visitation numbers that we reported on and how the surveys and stuff that we reported on were a little bit kind of dodgy at times. So it really set home with me. Um, so I took that to kind of the heart. So because of this, as an industry, we've really focused on shiny big numbers um, and giving them tangible, visible results. So kudos to Matt and, um, and his team for pulling in some true ROI numbers because we don't see that a lot in marketing. A lot of times it's still about reach or exposure. So we've kind of trained our industry to see the billboards and see the TV spots. And I've worked with a destination in Canada who they would specifically buy billboards on the way to work for a couple of their board members just so they could see the campaign and say, hey, you guys are doing some really good marketing. That's not a market for them at all, but they would spend the money just to make them happy because then the industry goes, yeah, 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 that's awesome. You guys are doing great work. We'll sign off on the budget for next year, right? So we need to get away from that. And it's partly our fault because we've taught our industry to look at big numbers because they're not marketing savvy necessarily. So we need to change things. And one of the problems that the tourism industry has, in my opinion, is that we're all guilty of looking over the fence at our neighbors. What are they doing? What cool tactics and what can we emulate? How can we do what they did? They got really big numbers, let's copy that, let's do that. We all do it and it works to some extent, but we're not necessarily applying our own marketing strategy to it, we're copying tactics. And we're not strategically looking at what are our business problems. So, and this is more important because in the digital world, we're all struggling to keep up and stay in tune with what's happening um, so we're looking at everybody's tactics, but we're losing the strategy in many ways. So what if we could just hit a giant reset button and stop and take a look at what we need to do and the conversation we need to have with our industry and how we can help them be more effective marketing their business or generating revenue. So let me see if this animates nicely. Yeah. It's better than an evolution slide. It's so pretty, metamorphosis, beautiful. So, from DMO's perspective, how do we evolve and be some, become something stronger and better for our industry and manage our destinations? And this comes down to leadership. Instead of just marketing, we need to start focusing on managing our destination like a business. How much revenue are we generating? Where is it coming from? And we need to start drilling into those questions because then we can make better informed decisions about where we put our marketing budgets. Because right now I hear a lot of you know, topics about um, everybody's going after China, it's a big market growing, everybody's throwing money there but is it right for your industry? Maybe, maybe not. So, um, this is what matters to most of our industry partners. And as destinations, we kind of forget this. And I remember talking to a couple years ago with a guy up in Fort McMurray, Canada, it's the big oil place. And I was telling this guy, you need a website. You don't have a website for your little fishing lodge? Like, how can you not have that? And he goes, Aaron, I have $1,000 of extra money at the end of the year, and it's really cold, minus 54 degrees Celsius sometimes. I need a generator to make sure that my customers don't freeze. I can't put that toward a website. And that really struck home with me because he just didn't have the time to market. He had business operations because he was a three-man shop. And so that really registered with me. So we need to change the conversation and go back to what's helping them drive business to themselves. And if they're getting business, it's good for the destination. People will talk and it has the network effect, etc. So stop measuring noise and change the conversation. Switching themes a little bit here, I saw this quote from uh, the former CEO of Eric, uh, Google, Eric Schmidt. And so he talks about how data is doubling every two days, um, essentially up until 2003, we're now cloning that data in two days. So he goes on to say five exabytes of data. I had no clue what the hell an exabyte is. Does anybody else want to try and guess what an exabyte is? No. So I had to go Google it and see what the hell is an exabyte. It sounds really impressive. So this is what I found, and just to put it in perspective, uh, an ant, um, in comparison, is a megabyte. That goes back to your old floppy disk. Does everybody remember floppy disks? That's about a megabyte in terms of storage, okay? So now, every two days, we have the equivalent of the diameter of the sun times five being created. And this just kind of blew me away in terms of the amount of content. 
putting it in terms of the top, from a novel to information, the human genome, to annual world literature production, and then two-thirds of annual production of information. So that's not even the full amount on scale. So this is really, really big. There's a heck of a lot of content. Why? Because we're in a digital world. So the takeaway that I, I thought about this is that your stories don't matter as much as they used to because there's so much content and information out there that other people's stories are gonna be more relevant because they're from a trusted network. And we've seen some of the stats from some of the other presenters this morning about 80% um, trust to 70% within their own um, um, anonymous people would have uh, similar interests. So there's all this content out there, but as destinations, we're trying to still produce our own content and reach these people. And it's, it, it's worked for the last 30 years, but it's a losing battle going forward. So now what we're trying to do is adapt to consumer behaviors. And we jump into all these fancy social media uh, networks that are popping up. There's a new one coming up every couple days, right? And I heard the one lady um, from the Shire said, we just cut two out because it just doesn't make sense for us. That's fantastic to see because we're still playing whack-a-mole. New network, new network, new network, and you just don't get anywhere. So putting in this perspective, your content isn't as significant as what everybody else can produce. So how do we tap into this? Well, from a marketing perspective, we got in here because um, is anybody familiar with the ADA model? Awareness, interest, decision, and action. I think uh, Joanne mentioned earlier in her presentation. But as destination marketers, we believe our role is to really create the awareness. Because if we can let people know that our destination exists, then people will be interested and they'll make the decision and they'll take action to book. And that's the way it's been many years when we control the mediums, the TV, the print, etc., like that. But now the world's fundamentally changed with the amount of content that's out there. So now that it's changed, we have to rewrite the consumer path to purchase model. And this is one from uh, Travel Alberta where I used to work, um, and it's probably one of the most extensive ones, and I won't go through the whole uh, detailed process, but what you can see is from the awareness to making it a dream, considering uh, making a plan, and then finalizing your travel arrangements, the advocacy part affects every step of that way. Because consumers can find stuff on TripAdvisor, they can be inspired on Facebook, they can be on the ground and tweet, where's a restaurant while I'm here? So every step of the way, they're seeking help from their social communities. And that's the relevance of other people's content. So when we rewrite the path to purchase and think about how this changes how we should be marketing as a destination, it comes back to the consumer. And I know a lot of people say, well, we're consumer-centric, we think about the consumers, and it's kind of a buzzword. But if we really put the consumer first, the first thing that matters how was your experience? Did you enjoy, where are you from, and what did you love about it? And focusing on their experience is gonna be more important because they will tell their friends, go visit this place, this is the best wine experience I've ever had, this is the best destination. So now we really start looking about making better experiences. This is when we can manage our industry and manage our destination. Going backwards in time, the four Ps of marketing. Do you guys remember these from Marketing 101? Uh, product, price, place, promotion. Two of these are relevant for a destination. We don't really worry about place and price because your place is your destination. But what matters is the product. So now if we really start to think about this world, if we can start to deliver kick-ass pro products with our industry and help them make remarkable experiences, people start promoting it through the word of mouth. Everything we've seen here has all been about that. So this fundamentally changes how we look at things Start with building better product, the word of mouth will follow. So we've all seen probably various numbers like this, but it costs five times more to acquire a new customer than to retain a customer. Um, and customer loyalty is the easiest way to reach a new market, new qualified markets, because they're telling of a friend of a friend, somebody who has the same vested, passionate interest as them, and it's going to have more credibility. So, this is a really important to, to see the shift here. What we need to do is start measuring the experience first. And I'll give you a little example of a destination I worked with, I won't name them. But they surveyed all the um, majority of their um, uh, people came to the destination. The number one problem is like something 70 some percent of people complained about the smelly caps. Everybody complained about the smelly caps. So what did they do that year? They took about close to a million dollars. They didn't even talk to the caps. They went and built shiny brochures, 230,000 of them, inserted them in a random newspaper, and shipped them out all over their, their region. No clue where that was going. 
And they just, they said that was great. We distributed 230,000 shiny objects. Now, what they should have done was look at how they could fix the cab issue, because every time somebody flies in, takes a cab, that's the first experience that they receive in that city. Then when they leave, they're back in that cab. And what do you think they're gonna tell their friends? Smelly cabs. So it's an opportunity missed for that destination. In that case, that's a business problem that they need to solve, but they're putting their head in the sand saying, we're just gonna focus on the marketing side. So, how do we do this? Simple, and Sophie mentioned this in her presentation, but on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend this destination to a friend? It's that simple. If you ask them this question, you will know if they're an advocate for you or a detractor for you. If you start to correlate this data based on what country are you from, where are you from, your demographics, and more sorts of information, now you can segment the people who love you and the people who don't. Somebody just mentioned, I think Matt mentioned before me, focus on the people you, that love you. If you focus on them, they'll tell their friends. So putting this into perspective, and like I mentioned, Sophie, you pretty much set me up for this, so thank you. This is what's called Net Promoter Score. And it's designed to take complicated customer surveys that are like 10 to 15 questions that people kind of just, yeah, I'm at seven and then now I just don't care and they, they stop. To simplify it to one question. And the way it works is there's the promoters. So on a scale of uh, zero to 10, if they say they're a nine or a 10, they're really enthusiastic about your destination or even your business. And they're super likely to go post their photos. They're gonna go leave a TripAdvisor review. They're the alpha people that you really wanna target because they're so passionate about what you offer. The sevens and eights, they're neutral. They're, hey, I had a good time, but I'm not gonna go be super excited about it when I go back home. Everybody else is a detractor because they're not gonna promote your brand. The reason this is a relevant score is by taking your promoter percentage and subtracting the percentage of detractors, you get a percentage out of 100. Going back to grade school, we all like percentages. The higher the percentage, the better we did. So it's simple, it's out of 100% essentially. Ideally, we'd have 100% net promoter, but that's pretty much impossible. Um, this has been linked to economic impact. And most Fortune 500 companies are using this model to determine if we get a 1% net promoter score increase, we can see a 5% increase in revenue. And there is an art and science to that for big businesses. Um, for destinations, it's simpler. If people love us, they're gonna promote us. How do we work with our industry now to uh, track that expenditure? <clears throat> so, I did a little bit of homework on this and I found a net promoter score data from 2006 across Australia. So I thought it'd be great to put up here. Yeah, oh shit, as some people are saying, right? So let's take a look at who came out on top. Broom. Broom had an 80% score. So they had 85% of people who promoted the destination, and then they had 5% that said this just wasn't a great place. Now, that's actually the highest score that um, anybody in the Australian industry received. This, Survey was done across, I think, about 22 different industries, um, airline, banking, et cetera, like that, and then this was the tourism results. But Broome had the highest score. Byron Bay was the next with a 69. Now, what was really interesting about this is those destinations, they're not big and they're glamorous like Sydney or Melbourne per se, but they own a really strong niche experience. And so when people get on the ground, they're impressed. This is exactly what we were looking for, and it doesn't have a lot of pretension. And, and as Sophie mentioned, if it sets your expectations for, and you deliver upon it, they're gonna be so stoked because they're getting what they paid for. And if you don't do that, that's when you're gonna get a detractor. And so some of the other cities, such as uh, Sydney and the bigger guys, they, they set a lot of expectations because we're such a big city. We have so many experiences. So it sets big time um, expectations. Um, now, poor Adelaide here, I don't know what happened there, so I'm sorry that I had to show this here, but this was a long time ago, um, so I'm sure the data has changed. Uh, and if you want to see the, the survey, I'll, I'll send you the results. I'm happy to share that. It was a really neat little study. But where I'm going with this is that there are pioneers who are starting to adopt this and see the benefit because it correlates to the digital marketing space. This is uh, Whistler. Um, and Whistler, uh, basically, they're ranked one of the top ski destinations in the world uh, as a resort. And so they, and I've actually taken the survey myself, they'll walk through the streets and they'll ask people, hey, can you come talk to us for a second? And they'll just say, hey, out of one to 10, what would you do? And so they, they've got a few ways that they do that. They also do it online, on Facebook, etc. 
but they believe in net promoter and they have seen a correlation to their social channels. The higher, as their net promoter increases, their social activity increases and it ends up in revenues. As a DMO, we can't see the revenue stream because we have to work on expenditure data that's estimated by your, your state or provincial uh, tourism uh, or uh, government. Um, but they're working with their industry to take that step closer. Anecdotally, a hotel will see, say, yeah, we've seen a 10% increase in the last year. They're not gonna tell you the hard numbers, but they'll tell you generic percentages. You can now take that data, a 1% increase in net promoter equals roughly a 10% expenditure increase from your industry. That's when you can start measuring the effectiveness of your social marketing or the word of mouth. Um, the other destination in Canada that's doing this is Canada. So Canada does a really good job with their net promoter score. What they do is they, they track by geo data. So as people come and visit from different countries, they'll ask the Japanese market or the, uh, the UK market, um, how likely are you to recommend this? So now they know that, for example, the Japanese market, they weren't really satisfied with the Canadian experience. As a result, they've had to move marketing dollars away because it just wasn't the right experience for that market. But now they've moved that to the UK market because people from the UK absolutely love Canada. So they can make smart marketing decisions based on what consumers are saying, and then that yields itself in, in advocacy, etc. So this is hopefully a couple of examples to kind of show you the direction that um, we as an industry should start looking. Um, to kind of wrap things up, I really want to challenge you guys, when you go back to your, um, after this conference, to your offices, go back and see if your objectives are based on mass exposure and reach, noise. Take a good look at your business plan or marketing plan or whatever you have written, your KPIs, and, and really think about that. Is it reach? Is it exposure? Or does that have a direct impact on the expenditures for your region? Um, if they are, you need to change your strategy. <clears throat> um, change your strategy to start linking back to objectives and how can you help your industry? The one thing I didn't really mention about Net Promoter here for the uh, industry specific is, as per um, Sophie's presentation, if your businesses can start asking this one question, you're automatically gonna see the types of experiences and businesses that are doing really well. That can aid where you need to focus your efforts to help some of your local industry. The net output for that will be Facebook success as per what you've seen with her campaign. So the kind of summaries here, create a business plan, not an advertising plan. And this really goes deep into taking a look at how marketing works and how you can work with your industry to, to teach them to market better through measuring things differently. Um, measure what matters. The noise and the reach, they're good indicators and they're nice pat on the back, but it's the safe way out to say, hey, look at the numbers, we're doing good. And then lastly, lead your industry. Your industry is probably struggling to understand the, sh the shift in the digital world. I know many of us are probably doing the same thing. So imagine if they don't have time to attend conferences like this, what they're feeling. So if we can really help lead them, that's gonna make a big difference for them. With that, thank you guys very much.